Hey, praise the Lord, Pastor Michael Jakes, and welcome to the Monday Night Bible Study, also known as the Line by Line Podcast. We're here once again with a Bible study for your soul. Amen. We pray that all is well with you tonight as we once again open up the Word of God. Amen. Streaming right now live over Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, Twitter, and Spreaker.com if you want to listen in only. Uh, we are also available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iTunes, iHeartRadio, CastBox, Podcast Addict, Podchaser, and many, many other podcast platforms. And then you can also go to our website at thatstheword.org while you're there. Uh, you can leave us your email address. We have amassed uh, an email list, uh, and we do have an, a newsletter that we do uh, send out from time to time, uh, letting you know what is going on in the ministry. Amen. You can also go uh, to our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel is That's the Word Ministries. Uh, by going there, uh, you can become a subscriber to our channel. Amen. And so we pray that you will take advantage of all of these things. We pray uh, that you will continue also to pray for us uh, as we continue uh, to get the word out to as many people as possible. You can help us. Uh, you can help us to do that by, if you're watching over Facebook, uh, you can share. If you're watching over Periscope or Twitter, uh, you can retweet. Even if you're watching on Facebook, or rather, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, you can also share this uh, to any other pod podcast platform, any other social media platform that you may be on. Amen? And so, once again, we pray that you will help us to get the Word of God out to as many people as possible. Become an ambassador of the gospel. Amen. Tonight we are going to continue in our series, in our series uh, entitled the book of Galatians. Amen. And we are in chapter number two, chapter number two of the book of Galatians. And this chapter, this chapter is filled uh, with what I will call uh, high drama, high drama, because in it, Paul has a very, very uh, necessary confrontation uh, with Peter, of all people, amen, and so we're going to read into that, and here in this chapter, Paul makes it abundantly clear that salvation, that is justification, is by faith in Christ alone, salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone, amen, and so he's going to hammer that in, and um, we pray that you once again be able to stay with us tonight as we open up this powerful chapter. Amen. We're going to pray and we're going to get right into this word for tonight. Amen. Lord, we bless your name. We thank you once again for giving us this opportunity uh, to share your word. Uh, Lord, we pray that you will be with us even now as we do so. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would draw those who need to hear this word to this place on the World Wide Web. Uh, Lord, I pray that you will speak tonight. Lord, put me in the background. Uh, Lord, allow your word to go forth in power. Uh, Lord, I pray you will give me Give me clarity of mind and heart, even as these words go forth. Lord, have your way. Bless us together right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. God is good. God is good. Now, as we always like to, always like to say, that we always do say, uh, God is working uh, behind the scenes. Behind the scenes, the Lord is working. Amen. And so we just bless him and we thank him for all uh, that he is doing. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, you can turn to the book of Galatians, uh, the book of Galatians, uh, chapter number two. Galatians chapter number two. Amen. All right, Galatians chapter number two. And we're going to read one verse at a time, of course. Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. Now, here, Paul is speaking of a trip that he took to Jerusalem. Now, at the end, near the end of the last chapter, Paul spoke about, actually in chapter 18, uh, verses 18 and 19 of the previous chapter, uh, Paul spoke about a trip uh, that he took to Jerusalem uh, approximately three years after he was saved. But here, now, he is speaking about something that happened uh, 14 years after that. Amen. 14 years after that. <clears throat> God bless you, my sister Mayu. God bless you. God bless you. Greetings to you. Uh, and here, here we see that he brings with him Barnabas and Titus also. Now, in verse number two, 
It says specifically that he went up by revelation. By revelation. This simply means that he was letting everyone know that no one told him to go. No one made him go. He wasn't going on his own recognizance. It was the Lord who was telling him to go. It was by revelation. And if you remember, our definition of revelation last week was, it's when the mighty act of God, it's, a, it's, a, it's the mighty act of God, whereby the Holy Spirit discloses to the human mind that which could not be understood without divine intervention. That is revelation. And here we see that the Holy Spirit reveals to Paul that he is to go up to Jerusalem. And so it says, I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. That's very important, that phrase there. He communicated unto them the gospel which he preached unto the Gentiles. Now, let me just make this perfectly clear. There is only one gospel. One gospel. Paul makes that clear in the first chapter when he says that there are other gospels. And he says, let me go there in verse uh, chapter number one uh, and verse number six. And he begins by chastising them, by saying, I marvel. That means he is shocked, he is surprised that you are so soon removed turned away from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, he says, unto another gospel, which is not another, he says, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, there uh, in verse number six, uh, when he is talking about uh, he's talking about another gospel. It is talking about a gospel of another kind, another kind of gospel. And he tells us in verse number seven that this other kind of gospel is not really a gospel at all. Amen. And so here, back in chapter number two, when he is talking about the gospel that he preached, he is preaching the gospel, the gospel. There is only one. Amen. And we're going to get into the nuts and bolts and the details about it as this chapter goes along. He says, but he spoke privately to those which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. Now, Paul, when he's talking about if I had run in vain, he's not talking about himself losing his own salvation. When he's talking about uh, run uh, or had run in vain, he was more concerned uh, about uh, his own reputation, possibly, and his own ministry. But he wasn't concerned about himself falling away from grace. Now, notice that he says that he spoke privately to those which were of reputation. Now, he is going to identify those who are of reputation in just a few moments. And that's, we might as well say, that's Peter, James, and John. Those were the men of reputation, the more well-known apostles of Jesus Christ at this particular time. And he says that he spoke to them privately. He spoke to them privately. And that was a that was a very smart thing to do. Verse number three, but neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be sanct to be circumcised. Now we know that in Judaism that circumcision was the right, uh, the Jewish right that uh, made them Jewish. It was what the law required of them. The law, notice what I said. It was what the law required of them as Jews to be circumcised. But Titus, who was a Greek, who was one of uh, Paul's fellow servants uh, that uh, was probably brought into the faith by Paul, he was a Greek, meaning that he was a Gentile. He was not a Jew. And he was not compelled to be circumcised. Or he did not feel the need to be, uh, to be circumcised. He did not, he was not being forced into doing something that was not necessary. Because there were some, there were some, as we read, goes, let's go back to verse number one. Um, verse number one, uh, there were some that would come and trouble them and would pervert the gospel of Christ and how they were going about perverting the gospel of Christ they were telling they were telling the gentile christians 
that in order to be a full Christian, in order to be a, a, a real Christian, if I can use that phrase, that they needed to be circumcised. In other words, you need to follow the Old Testament law to solidify your Christian faith now. But Paul is going to make his argument in a, in a moment that this is not the case. Verse number four. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Now, I want to break down this particular verse because it's very important. Verse number four. He says, but because of and because of false brethren. Notice what he says. False brethren. Now, from time to time here in this Bible study, we go into the Greek to give us a greater understanding of what is being said. Here, these false brethren, in the original language, it's called the pseudo-delphos. Pseudo-delphos. Pseudo means false. Delphos means brother. They were false brothers, okay? And that is very, uh, we need to understand that. Now, let me read what it means in the Greek to be a false brother. It's one who ostentatiously or very in an outward, very showy type of way, one who ostentatiously professes to be a Christian, but is destitute or empty of that which makes a true Christian. And the only thing, the deciding factor that makes a Christian a Christian is if they have the Holy Spirit on the inside. The book of Romans, uh, chapter number uh, 8, uh, in the beginning of the chapter. Let's go there real quick. Romans, chapter number 8, and let's look at verse number mm -hmm, 9. Chapter number 8, Romans, chapter 8, verse number 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, dwell in you. Then he says the statement. Now, if any man, any individual, have not the Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The Spirit of Christ is the Holy Spirit. If anyone doesn't have the Spirit of Christ in them, they are not his. They don't belong to God. And if you don't belong to God, it means that you're not saved. Okay? And that's what he is talking about there. That echoes back to Rome. That echoes back to Romans chapter number seven, uh, verses 23, 24, and twenty-five, uh, where he tells those individuals who said that they did, they they prophesied in his name, that they did great works in his name, and they did all these things in his name. And then Jesus tells them, "I never knew you." That was because they were not who they thought they were. They the, they were destitute of the Spirit, and so Christ identifies them as not being. Is. Amen. Now here, back in Galatians chapter number uh, two and verse number four, these false brethren were brought in unawares, unawares. They came in privately. They came in secretly, but they came in with a mission. They came in with the sole purpose of trying to infiltrate the body and to bring in this false teaching. Now to them, it was not false. Let me, let me stipulate that. To them, it was not false. Uh, everyone who comes with a false teaching is not doing it maliciously just to bring people down. These are things that people actually believe. They've come to some conclusion that there is truth in what they are saying. Amen? And that may have been the case here. But the way we read it here, it sounds as if many of these individuals were trying to detract individuals from uh, following Christ the way they should. Now, also, you have to understand that many of the many of the Jewish, uh, many of the uh, Gentile Christians who knew nothing, who knew nothing about the Old Testament law, were being told now that they had to get circumcised. They're being told now that they had to follow uh, the law, and now that they uh, had these individuals telling them this, they're caught between the two: should I not, or should I? Should I not or should I? And those who were leaning toward doing it, when these individuals came along, then they were tempted to do so. Amen? Let's continue here in verse number four. So they came in privately to spy out 
to spy out our liberty, our freedom, which we have in Christ. If you go to the book of Galatians, let's go, let's go a couple of chapters ahead. Galatians uh, chapter number five and verse number one, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. I know I jumped several chapters ahead, but I needed to state that particular truth uh, to solidify what he says right here. We are free in Christ. Free in Christ. He set us free so that we could be free. Amen? And so that's very important. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. God bless you, my sister Yvonne. The yoke of bondage, the yoke of bondage is the law. The law. Now, when we talk about law, here, obviously, they are talking about the Mosaic law. What we read in uh, Genesis, uh, actually Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers, the, the, the books of the law. But here, we apply, we apply what they tell us here in this way. There are other things that we can do that can become law in our life. Other things. Other things that are very basic. Other things that, are, that we are supposed to do that can become law. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on it uh, tonight. Probably next week we'll get into it a little deeper. Uh, but reading your Bible and praying and fasting and all of these things Proper, correct, godly, righteous things that we are supposed to do can become a law. We can make them laws in our life. And they were never intended to be so. Amen? They were never intended to be so. And so, we read here that in verse number 4, continuing, that they came in to spy out their liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Now you take that verse and you tie it in with Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 1 that we just read, talking about bondage. Bring them into bondage. What bondage? Bondage in keeping the law. Trying to keep the law. Trying to do and do and do and become and become. And it becomes arduous. The Christian life was not meant to be arduous. It wasn't meant to be so. That's why we read, even Jesus himself uh, says in Matthew uh, chapter number 11. Let's go there. Matthew chapter number 11 and verse number 28. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor, labor. That's the work. That's the arduous, the arduousness that some people put in to living, to try to be righteous. Uh, come unto me, all the at labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest. Rest from what? Rest from trying to keep law. Verse number 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's the Christian life. Not a yoke of bondage, but a yoke of ease. It's not do, 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 and you must go, go, go. And that's not the Christian life. Amen. And we who have we who have been caught up in that type of lifestyle, uh, we learn very quickly that there is something wrong, but sometimes we can't put our finger on it. Why am I doing and going and struggling and trying and and it's not getting any better because we have our focus. We have our focus on what we are doing rather than what we are believing, our faith. Our faith must be in the right place. We'll get into that. Verse number six, verse number five, I'm sorry. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. This is what Paul the Apostle was all about. This is what he was all about. He, his ministry consisted of him preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified and him upholding the truth and purity of the gospel. 
He would not bow. He would not give in. He would not allow those who were Judaizers, those who were trying to teach otherwise, uh, adherence to the law, he was not allowing them to infringe upon the truth of the gospel. Amen? He made sure that he did not do it. He says, not for an hour. In other words, in our uh, vernacular, not for a moment did he entertain uh, doing what the Judaizers were telling them that they needed to do. Not for a moment. Verse number six. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it makes no matter to me. God accepts no man person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. What Paul is saying here is that he was not impressed or intimidated by anyone's, uh, by anyone's uh, credentials. Okay? He was an apostle. He had been given his apostleship by the Lord himself. And so he was not lifting himself up and putting others down. But once again, he was not impressed by anyone's uh, anyone's uh, credentials. Okay? Whatsoever they were, it makes no matter to me. God accepts no man's person. Okay? We are all the same in the Lord's sight. For they who seem to be somewhat or someone in conference added nothing to me. Added nothing to me. Verse number seven. But contrary wise, or on the other hand, when they saw the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Now let me stop. Let me pause right there for a moment. You see him talking about here, Paul talking about the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me. And the gospel of the circumcision was committed unto Peter. What this simply means is that Peter and Paul had different ministries. Different ministries, but they both had the same message. The same message. Remember what we said at the outset. There is only one gospel. Now there may be many, many different ministries. And many different ministries have different, if I can use the word, they have different flavors. But it's one message. There are not two gospels or three gospels. No, there's one gospel. And that gospel is Christ and him crucified. Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is the gospel. And of course, the fact that Jesus uh, died on the third day and he was, he was risen again. We cannot, we cannot not place the resurrection as part of the gospel because it is a part of the gospel. But here he says that the gospel of uncircumcision was committed to Paul and the gospel of the circumcision was committed to Peter. In other words, Paul preached to those who were Gentiles uncircumcised Gentiles, and Peter preached to those who were circumcised, those who were Jews. Once again, two separate ministries, ministering to two separate peoples, but one message. Now, this could change at any time. This was not concrete because we know that Paul also, we know that Paul also preached to the Jews. And we know also that Peter preached to the Gentiles. Look at the story of of uh, look at the story of Cornelius in the book of Acts. We know that Paul preached to Gentiles. Amen. And so whoever the Lord puts in front of you, we are to speak the gospel. No matter who they are. Amen. Verse number eight. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. That's a Powerful, powerful verse. And what that verse is simply saying, it's that the Holy Spirit worked in both of us. If the message is Jesus Christ and him crucified, then the Holy Spirit is going to work through it. He's going to work through those individuals who are preaching it. Amen? If we are preaching that gospel. Amen? And it, once again, there's only one gospel. Amen? Jesus Christ and him crucified. And when we say Jesus Christ and him crucified, what I'm trying to lay down is Jesus Christ plus nothing. It's Jesus Christ plus nothing. Amen. God bless you, my sister Genevieve. God bless you. 
It's Jesus Christ plus nothing. I want to read verse 8 again. For he that, that he is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works in us. He empowers us to do what we do. For he that wrought effectually. Let me give you an understanding of what that phrase, to, 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 as he wrought effectually. Okay? Uh, it, simply, it, it simply means that he uh, who was operating. He who was operating mightily uh, in Peter, the same one, the Holy Spirit, was operating mightily in me to bring about the same uh, result, that souls be saved. Once again, one to, the, one, to those who are uns, one, one to those who are uncircumcised, the Jews, and one to those who are circumcised, rather uncircumcised the Gentiles and circumcised the Jews. All of us need Jesus. Everyone, Jew and Gentile alike. Amen. Now, verse number nine. And when James, Cephas, and John, Cephas is another name for Peter. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. All right? Now, <clears throat> here in verse number nine, James, Peter, and John, these are the men of reputation. And they were the ones who, at this particular time, it says, and they seemed to be, they were, they were the ones who were the pillars. They were the ones who were uh, the pillars at that particular time. They were the ones who had the authority, the influence uh, in the church at this time in history. Uh, and when they realized, when they came to the understanding uh, that grace was given to Paul, in other words, that he was real, because at the beginning, at the very beginning of Paul's ministry, uh, when he first got saved, no one trusted him. No one believed that this was the same person who was trying to ransack and destroy the church, was now preaching the very message that he tried to destroy. And so even the disciples, even the apostles at that time, they had their reservations. Should we trust him? Should we not trust him? Is he real? Is this a ruse? Is this fake? Is he trying to trap us? They were not sure. But here we see that when they realized that grace had been given unto him, that he had been saved by grace through faith, just like them, that they gave him and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. And that right hand of fellowship simply signifies friendship and agreement. You're in. We trust you. We believe you. You're on our side. We give you the right hand of fellowship. Amen. And they gave him. And they gave him uh, they, that he should go uh, to the to the heathen, the Gentiles, the those who were uncircumcised, and they unto the circumcision. They agreed to go their separate ways. They agreed to go their separate ways in their separate ministries, yet united. Once again, united in that one message, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. That one message. Verse number 10. Verse number 10. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which also, which I also was forward to do. This was something that Paul already was in his spirit, in his heart to do, to remember and, and, and take note of the poor as he ministered. And so this is what he did. This is what he did. Verse number 11. Verse number 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face. I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Now this, this is powerful here. This is powerful because here, here we see that Paul the Apostle, that rather, uh, Paul the Apostle, yes, that he had to confront Peter the Apostle, who was older than him, who was more seasoned than him, if I could use that phrase. 
Uh, he walked with Christ personally, but he had to confront him and he had to rebuke him for something that he was doing. Amen? But he did it to keep the gospel pure. Amen? Let's read on. It says, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Verse number 12. For before that certain, he's going to explain the, the reason why he had to do this. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Now simply here, what he is saying here is that there were some believers who came with who came uh, with James, uh, but he had been eating with Gentiles. But when the Judaizers came, the ones who say that you can't mix with and you have to make sure that you do the Jewish things and all that, he separated himself from the Gentiles because he didn't want any flack. He didn't want any. He didn't want to get verbally uh, castigated uh, by the Judaizers, so he separated himself. He didn't want them to think that he was mixing in with Gentiles because he was a Jew. Okay, and this was after this was after Peter had had uh, his meeting, uh, after he had had his meeting, uh, his vision uh, that the Lord told him that it was okay to uh, to to deal with. That salvation was also for Gentiles. So he had had that vision already. But yet we see him reverting back uh, to his old self momentarily. For fear of man. How many times have we been afraid to say something or do something that we know that we should do. But we don't because we are afraid of reaction. We're afraid of what might happen. What people might say if we say that. If we do that. And that's where Peter was at this particular time. He feared them which were of the circumcision. You must be circumcised to be a Christian. You have to follow the law if you be a Christian. Uh, you must not mix in with Gentiles if you are to be a Christian, a true Christian. And all of this caused Peter to separate himself. Amen? Verse number, verse number 13. God bless you, my brother Sam. God bless you. And the other Jews, the other Jews, along with Peter, dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas, who was with Paul, also was carried away with their dissimulation. I'm reading from the King James Version. I know that we don't understand what these words mean, but we're going to uh, explain it to you. Uh, the Jews that were in this company, when they saw what Peter the great Peter, and I'm using great because once again he was that he was one of those individuals of reputation. He was a pillar. When they saw that Peter separated himself from the Gentiles, then the other Jews said, "Hey, he he separated himself. We better separate ourselves too. We better not mix in neither he either." And even Barnabas, who was coupled with Paul, it says here that he was carried away with their dissimulation. The word dissembled means to play the hypocrite. Peter knew better. Peter understood the truth. But because of others, he caved in and he did otherwise. He played the hypocrite. And others also followed and were carried away with his hypocrisy. He was leading a group of Jews to do something that they should not have done. And this is why Paul the Apostle had to stand up and confront him to his face. Okay, he had to stand up and confront him to his face. Verse number 14. But when I saw, this is Paul speaking, when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, and that's very important, this must have, this must have hurt Paul, in a sense, once again, because of who uh, who uh, Peter was, we understand that he said that he uh, people's um, that who somebody body was uh, was not that important to him. But there was a level of, level of respect that people earn after a time, and Peter had earned that respect. He walked with 
he, he walked with Jesus Christ. He walked with him and he had been faithful to him since obviously his incident of, of, of denying him three times. He was faithful. He was an older man. And here now Paul comes along and is going to put him in his place. And this is what he told him. If, if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as the Jews? Now let me read verse number 14 from the Amplified Version. From time to time, I will refer to another version just to bring uh, some more understanding uh, to a particular verse. Here's the Amplified Version, which explains it all very clearly. This is what uh, Paul told Peter. If you, being a Jew, live as you have been living, like a Gentile and not a Jew, because they had he had come into Christ, and he understood that, the law was no longer a part of his life, that he did not need to follow Mosaic law anymore. How is it that you are now virtually forcing Gentiles to live like Jews? If they, are, uh, if they uh, will not eat with you. Because of what Peter did, others were willing to follow him. And that's why this incident was very, very important. Because the truth and purity of the gospel was at stake. It was at stake. And Paul, once again, he was interested in keeping the purity of the gospel. Once again, going back to verse 5, he says that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. That was very important. So he says... How can you do this? If you are no longer as a Jew, if you are no longer as a Jew living like a Jew, why are you causing Gentiles to live like a Jew? You're not doing it. So that was very, very important that he made that statement. Very important. We who are Jews by nature, verse number 15, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. In other words, uh, the Gentiles grew up, they were born without the knowledge of the law. They only knew what they hear from those who were Jews who were privileged to have the law to follow after, at least to help them to live righteously to a point. And that's all that law can do, help you to live righteously to a point, but it cannot save you. Law cannot save you. Verse number 16, knowing, once again, he's going to continue his argument, knowing that a man, now let's, I'm going to break down verse number 16 this way. Verse number 16, three times in verse number 16, Paul makes the statement that justification or salvation is by faith in Christ alone. Three times he makes this statement in this one verse. Number one. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Of can be also translated in. Faith in Jesus Christ. So number one, it was general. He says man. Number two, verse number 16. But by the law of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by works of the law. Number two, it was personal. He said, we, us. Number three, still in verse number 16. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And that, number three, universal. No flesh, no one can be justified or made righteous. Justification is a word that simply means made righteous. No one can be made righteous by keeping the law or law. Cannot be made righteous. It is not possible. God requires faith in Christ alone. Alone. Not by works. You know Ephesians chapter 2 
verses 8 and 9. For we are saved by grace through faith. It is the gift of God, not of works. Works, the things that you do, not of works, lest any man should boast. We can't brag about the fact that look what I do and look what I did and look how much I'm doing. and look. If that was the criteria, then it wouldn't be it wouldn't be true salvation. But that is not the criteria. It's by faith in Christ alone. Verse number 17. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. What he is saying here, in essence, is that if the Judaizers are right, then guess what? Christ is wrong. If the Judaizers are right about our salvation, then Christ is wrong. Because Christ never said the things that the Judaizers were trying to say. If we, if while we seek to be justified, while we're saved, we ourselves are found sinners. What makes us sinners here in this context, in this verse? Trying to revert back to the law. He's going to explain that in the very uh, next verse. Trying to go back into law causes you to be a sinner. You are sinning when you go back into the law. When you try to do those things required by the Jews in Judaism, when we try to continue to do those things while we are living under grace, we, verse number 18, for if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Paul is simply saying, Paul is saying here, if I go back and do those things which I tore down, and he's talking about the law. He didn't tear down the law, but he, once again, scripture says that we're not justified by the law. So if I go back into law, I make myself a transgressor. Transgressor means I sin. I'm sinning by going backward. I'm no longer moving forward. I am moving backward. And that is problematic. Verse number 19. For I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I, through the law. That phrase simply means that it was through the law. It was through the law, which is a schoolmaster, that led him to his life in Christ. The law. And that was that is what the law was meant to do. Uh, we, we see uh, we see in verse uh, chapter number three, jumping ahead one chapter, verse number twenty-four. Wherefore, wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. That's the purpose of the law. Not to try and make ourselves righteous. Not to try and do, no. The purpose of the law was to bring us to Christ. That we might be justified by faith. Why do you need to be justified by faith? If you're already justified by the law. No, you can't be justified. You can't be made righteous by keeping the law. It cannot be done. Scripture tells us right here. So I, through the law, because of the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Notice that he doesn't say the law is dead. The law is not dead. He is dead to the law. Okay? That's very important to understand. The law is not dead. He is dead to it. That's very important to understand. Verse number 20. One of the greatest verses in the entire Bible. Because in a nutshell, we see in verse number 20, how to live for God. How to live for God. Verse number 20. I am crucified. With Christ, every one of us who are in Christ, this is where we are. 
I am crucified with Christ. We have to go back to Romans chapter number six to get a further understanding of that. That's not the purpose of this study right now, but you will find this in the book of Romans chapter number six, the first six verses especially. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. He says, I'm dead. He says, I'm crucified with Christ. And when we talk about crucifixion, we're talking about death. But he says, nevertheless, in spite of that, I live. Yet, not I, but Christ in me. Christ lives in me. Amen? And the life which I now live, he says, in the flesh, I live. In other words, the life that I now live in this mortal, corrupted body, he says, I live by the faith of or in the Son of God. How do I live my life? By faith in the Son of God. Faith in the Son of God is how I live this life. That's how I approach my walk with the Lord. By placing my faith in Christ and what he has accomplished on the cross. What did Jesus Christ accomplish on the cross? Victory. Victory. Colossians chapter 2 verses 15 and 16. He nailed, he nailed the writing which was against us to the cross. Amen. God bless you, my brother Clarence and Diana. He nailed, he nailed uh, the certificate of law that was against us to the cross. Amen. And so he says, I now live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Speaking of the sacrificial death sacrificial uh, death that Christ died. Verse number 21. And this is what can happen. This is what can happen to every single child of God. And I believe that all of us have been here. All of us have been here. Many are still there. Many of us struggle not to go back here. But this is so true. Verse number 21. He says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. And what does he mean by frustrating the grace of God? He is talking about, I do not despise it. I do not reject it. I do not disregard it. I do not set it aside. And I do not do away with it. How can we, how can we frustrate the grace of God? The grace of God. He says, for if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. How? How do we frustrate the grace of God? By reverting back to law. Reverting back to law frustrates the grace of God. Sets it aside. Pushes it aside. That's what it does. To go back into the law does two things. Number one, it makes you into a transgressor that we just read in verse number 18. And number two, in chapter number five, Galatians, once again, chapter number five and verse number four, it causes you to fall from grace. We've heard that phrase in our American language, to fall from grace, to fall from grace, where this verse is where it comes from. Galatians five and four, Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. If you think that Christ is the one, if rather, if you think it's the law that is making you righteous, then Christ is become of none, none effect to you. That is, we didn't get to that yet. We're going to get to it in a few weeks. But that is powerful. Okay? He says, if this happens, he says, ye are fallen from grace. To fall from grace is to set aside the grace of God by going back into law. Law. And it's talking about the Mosaic law and it's talking about anything that we may do. Any of the Christian disciplines that are absolutely vital and necessary, we can turn them into law. Once again, I cannot stress this enough. We are not trying to say that these things are not to be done. 
They are supposed to be done. Please read your Bible daily. Please pray daily. Pre please speak to others about Christ as often as you can. Please do these things. Fast whenever the Lord uh, tells you to fast. These are necessary things. But they can become laws in our life. And once again, they are not meant to be laws. Not laws. If I don't do it, God is angry. If I don't do it, I don't feel right. We need to not allow these things to become law in our life. Not at all. And so this is very, very important. If we frustrate grace and go back to law, then Christ is dead in vain. Why did Christ need to die for our sins to make us righteous if all we have to do is keep the law to be righteous? Then Christ died in vain. What was the point of that? But that is not the case. He did not die in vain because law cannot justify anyone. Amen? So I pray these are difficult words. These are hard words. But this is the truth of the gospel. This is the book of Galatians. Powerful, powerful book. Now, when we come together next week, I hope that you can be with us next week uh, because we are going to come upon, stumble upon, that's probably not the right word to use, but we are going to be confronted uh, with some of the most powerful words uh, in this particular book, some, some of the most powerful language in the Bible when we read the words that the just shall live by faith. That's in chapter number three. So please uh, make it a note. Make sure you are with us next week. Amen. We're going to pray. Lord, we bless your name. We thank you tonight that you have given us uh, your word. And Lord, we know that your word will not return void, that it, that it will accomplish the purpose where it was sent, Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray that you will speak to our hearts, Lord Jesus. Lord, we know that many of the things that we spoke tonight uh, may be difficult and, and maybe uh, some do not fully uh, understand, but we pray that your spirit uh, will enlighten and, and open up the hearts and minds of all those who come upon this word here tonight. Lord, I pray that you will have your way. Continue to give us peace and bless us as we continue uh, to stay true uh, to your word. Lord, have your way. Bless us even right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. We bless the name of the Lord. We bless the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I believe that this is being streamed right now to our uh, on Facebook to our uh, that's the word ministries uh, page. Uh, for some reason, my my uh, ministry page is is uh, is streaming, but my uh, the normal page that we stream on my uh, my personal page is not there. But we will get this over to our personal page as soon as we are done, and I will make the necessary adjustments to get the podcast back on uh, my personal page. But if you're watching over Facebook right now and you're watching on our uh, on our ministry page, uh, we are going to be uh, broadcasting, podcasting all of our all of our podcasts on our ministry page from here on in. Amen. And we once again want to thank Spreaker.com, those on the audio side. We want to welcome you back into the live fold. We know that we've been away for several months, uh, but right now we want to welcome you back in. We are glad you are listening, glad you've been a part of what we are doing here. Amen. Now, you can go also go to our YouTube channel uh, and type in Pastor Michael Jakes. That'll bring you right to where we are there. And hopefully you can become a subscriber uh, to our channel. Amen. Uh, you can also go to our website at that's the word dot org. While you're there, you can leave us your email address on our contact page uh, that you might uh, be abreast of what we are doing in the ministry. We do send out a newsletter uh, each month letting you know what exactly is going on in the ministry. Amen. You can also find all of our podcast streaming on several podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iTunes, iHeartRadio, CastBox, Podcast Addict, Podcast Chaser, and a host of others. Amen. And so we pray that you will continue uh, to stay with us as we continue to open up the Word of God. Now, on tomorrow night, 
Tomorrow night, we are continuing in our series, Forward March. Forward March, encouraging words to equip you to equip you for the year. Amen. We've seen many things already take place this year, and we want to be empowered. We want to be ready. We want to we want to be as soldiers, and we want to march forward no matter what takes place. Amen. And so, join us tomorrow night for an encouraging word. Amen. Also, on Wednesday night, we have begun a brand new direction in our Cutting It Right Bible study. Uh, first principles of the Christian life. First principles of the Christian life. If you are a new Christian, if you are a growing Christian, which we all ought to be, uh, if you need uh, to learn more, if you feel that you need to learn more about the Christian faith, then you can join us on Wednesday night. First principles of the Christian life. Amen. And so we look forward to seeing you then. Amen. And on Wednesday night, we're continuing uh, in our a lesson on defining a disciple, defining a disciple part two coming up on Wednesday night. We hope that you can be with us tomorrow night, 8.30 p.m., Wednesday night, 8.30 p.m. You can also join us on Sunday mornings at 11.30 a.m. for the Sunday Sermon Series, amen? And we're also in the midst of a uh, powerful series on our Sunday Sermon Series also, amen? And so I pray that you will once again follow this ministry. We're leading you to the word, in the word, by the word, and through the word. Amen. So we pray that you will be able to stay with us. Amen. I'm Pastor Michael Jakes. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being with us. God bless all of you who joined us tonight. It is good to see you all. And we will see you next time, hopefully tomorrow night, on the Bible Speaks Live at 8.30 p.m. We'll see you then. May God bless you.